Okay, this is lesson 6.8, and it's a continuation of the ideas that we last talked with in lesson 6.7. Remember how in lesson 6.7 we use something called the Riemann sum to try to approximate a definite integral? All those Riemann sums were rectangles, but you noticed, at least I hope you noticed, that they weren't very good approximations because with the rectangle there's a lot of times when the area was either missing or I took too much of it. And so instead of using a rectangle shape, let me introduce to you another shape. Perhaps we can use a trapezoid, and that gives rise to this trapezoidal approximation. Now I hope you can visualize and see why a trapezoid approximation is actually much more accurate than using rectangles, especially when we have curves, right? Rectangles, yeah, not so great. Trapezoids, perhaps? Ooh feels much more, right? Yeah. So that's why we introduce you this other idea called the trapezoidal approximation. Now, before we do that, we have to figure out how to find the area of a trapezoid. And hopefully you can see that the area can be equal to a half times h plus b sub 1 plus b sub 2. That would be using this picture over here. Why do we have that? It's like having the height and then the half, and then the b1 plus b2 is like taking the average of the two parallel sides. Unfortunately for us, most of our trapezoids won't look this way. We will have to rotate it uh, so it looks something like this. And therefore now we know that our formula for the area of the trapezoid should be just one half of the width multiplied by the summation of the two parallel heights, the heights from the left side and also the right side. Okay? So when I ask you to approximate the value of a different integral using trapezoids, we're going to use the exact same strategy as we did for the Riemann sums, but now instead of having rectangles, we're going to add trapezoids. So let's take a look. Here's the same example as in lesson 6.7. I want you to now approximate this same definite integral by adding the area of five trapezoids shown. Now notice my trapezoids also don't have to be equal width, okay? The widths can be different, not a problem there. All right, so let's go ahead and figure this out. Once again, it's an approximation, so make sure you are using the correct notation, uh, approximate. And then for number one here, the first trapezoid, notice if I use the formula, it would be one half times the width. The width in this case is two. And the average of the two heights, so the left height would be zero, and the right height would be four. And that would be the formula that we use. Now notice this is actually also a triangle, right? It's like base times height, right? Two times four, the height divided by two. So in this case, yeah, trapezoid, triangle, <laughs> you can say uh, triangle is a special type of trapezoid. Looking at trapezoid number two now, I'm going to use blue for this one. Hopefully you can see that the length of the width is three units. So one half multiplied by three. And then now we're going to take the average of the heights, or not the average, the sum of the heights here. So that would be 4, that would be the left height, and then also 3, the right height. Keep going, trapezoid number 3, notice in this case, I think that the width is just 1, and then the left height is 3, the right height is 2. Nice. We'll keep going now with the fourth one. And I'll use black. Once again, I look at this and I'm thinking the width is 2. And notice in this case, the height of both the left and the right is also 2. Remember this case here, that's a rectangle. Yeah, so you could also say that a rectangle is a special type of trapezoid. And then finally, the last one here, plus one half. The width is also two units. And then the two heights that we're going to use are two. That's the left endpoint height. 
and then I believe five, the right end point height. Okay? So I'm not actually going to add this up, but that's how we can calculate the approximate area using the trapezoidal approximation. Okay? Now, just a quick note here, once again, the area formula for a trapezoid also works for a triangle. And that's what we just did with the one in red, right? Where one of the heights is equal to zero. Or a rectangle, that's the one we did in black, when the heights were the same. If you do forget the formula of trapezoid, don't worry about it. You can always draw your areas as rectangles and triangles, right? So let me show you what I mean by that. If I take trapezoid number two, I could just have a nice little triangle here, right, in black. And I could also add the rectangle here in blue. That triangle plus the rectangle also equals to the area of the trapezoid. Okay. Um, you could also average the values from the left and right even sums, right? Um, so it doesn't matter what you do. Just in any case, make sure that you show a clear setup of your work, so that when you're doing the AP exam or any t tests from your teacher, they know what you are doing. All right, let's look at example number two. So, this time, weird shape. I want you to use these trapezoids with four equal subdivisions this time to approximate the area shown here. So, four equal subdivisions. I'm looking at this and saying, hey, starts at 10, ends at 50. So, my width, 50 minus 10 divided by four subdivisions, so each of them is uh, 10 units in width, which makes sense. And then now I'm just going to find the area. I'm going to use the approximation sign. One half times 10. And for the first one, I'm looking at these n values, and you're like, I can't see them. You're right, but there is a table. So use the values in the table from 20 to 30. Once again, the width is still 10, but now I'm going to use the height at 20, which is 2, the height at 30, which is 2.5. Keep going, 1 half times 10, it's going to be 30 to 40, so 2.5 plus 3.5. And then the final trapezoid, yeah, using the corresponding final values of 3.5 and 2.2. And once again, I'm not going to calculate this, but you can if you want to get the actual number, but this is how you do it. Okay? Now you're thinking, these are great approximations, but I still want the best and most accurate answer possible. So my question to you is, how do you think we can get a more accurate answer here? What can I do with these approximations to make it more accurate? Notice that my trapezoids or my rectangles, whatever I'm using, the widths are pretty wide here. So there's a lot of extra stuff that I'm counting or not counting, right? So how can I change this so that I get a better approximation? Now you might be thinking, hey, I should actually have more trapezoids, right? So as the number of subdivisions increase, so the more trapezoids that you have, yes, the accuracy of this sum, whether it be a Riemann sum or a trapezoid sum, whatever, it of course will improve. Now, I know there's no such thing as perfect accuracy, but if you had in your mind a way to actually divide this as much as possible, how can you actually get it to be equal the actual sum? Hopefully you would be visualizing these trapezoids as really, really thin lines, so thin that you can just put them together and it would actually equal to the sum. So. The idea is very thin lines, you need more and more subdivisions, probably you need an infinitely many subdivisions. And if I need to approach that idea of infinity, well guess what? Back to what we learned way, way back in Unit 1. This word called the limit. We need to make sure that the limit as the number of subintervals goes to infinity. So we want the limit as n approaches to infinity, where n stands for the number of subdivisions. Okay, we want that to be as big as possible, because when it's as big as possible, then we'll get the most accurate answer possible. And so, what that's saying here is the definite integral is equal to, and here's our idea, the limit 
Okay, as n approached to infinity of, yes, this is the summation sign. Hopefully you've seen this before in your pre-calculus studies. The summation of what? Well, it's of all of these f of x values times delta x. What does that mean? Well, delta x here, that would be the width of each of your subdivisions. And the f of a plus k delta x, this actually just represents the actual height values, right? Because we figure out each of the heights by plugging in the corresponding x value, that would be this, into the f function. So let me just say this once again. The limit as the sum. Here we have the heights. And finally, we have the width. And how this corresponds to the definite integral? Well, the dx then represents the width. The f of x represents the height. And the integral is really the limit of the summation. All right, so that's how those pieces connect with each other. Now, this final expression over here, you're like, where'd that come from? Well, remember how I always calculate the width? The width is always just b minus a over n, okay? And then what we've done is we've taken this b minus a over n and we've stuck it into wherever you see delta x. So wherever you see delta x, that's this b minus a over n, okay? The entire expression here that I'm going to highlight right now in blue represents the right-hand heights because starting at my a value and adding k, k is like a counter here, right? And so I can add 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. So if I'm adding 1 multiplied by the width, that gives me the first particular height, the first right-hand height. So, for example, now, if I ask you to look at this picture, okay, when I have k equals to 1, I'm starting with my a value, in this case, which would be 10, and I'm adding one subinterval to it, which would be 20, and I'm asking for the height here, so for the first trapezoid, I'm using the right-hand height, that's why we have this idea of the right-hand height. If k was 2, I'm starting at 10, going 2 over, here's my gain, once again, the right-hand height. Okay? And so for our AP exam, you only need to know pretty much these two ideas. And you need to be able to go back and forth. Being able to write a definite integral as a infinite right Riemann sum. Or given a Riemann sum, be able to write it as an integral. Okay? So I've seen this on the AP exam quite a few times lately with the new curriculum. Um, usually on the multiple choice part of the exam. So let's see how we can do this. Okay. Example number three. Uh, write the integral from one to four of the function x to the power five as an infinite Riemann sum. Okay. So <clears throat> first of all, we need to figure out what that delta x is or the width. Okay. So delta x or the width is always given by the formula b minus a over n. So in this case, b, 4, minus a, 1, over n. We don't know n, so that's just 3 over n. Okay? Do we know what the a value is? Yeah, a. a equals to 1. Good. So if you know that, we're already pretty much there. Because we're saying that this definite integral is equal to this expression for the limit. So let me start writing it. The limit as n approached to infinity right because we want as many n's as possible the sum of k equals to 1 to n so we're using a sum of a whole bunch of intervals of the function f of okay now what is my function here ah my function is x to the power of 5 so i'm not going to use the f notation here i'm just going to use my function notation which is some x raised to the power of 5 now what is my x well looking at the expression my x is the a value which is 1 plus k times the delta x, b minus a over n, so that's 3 over n, okay? And then don't forget, we should multiply that by our delta x, which should be 3 over n out here, okay? And there you go. Now, you might want to tidy this up 
by making this part a little bit nicer here. So if you really want it that way, let me just rewrite it like this. The limit as n approach to infinity, the sum of k equals to 1 to n, of the expression 1 plus, and I'll just write this as 3k over n, to the power of 5, because that's the function, then multiply by delta x, which is just 3 over n, and close the bracket. That's it. And you're done. Okay. Now, going the other way then, example number four, I have given you the limit summation notation. I want you to go back and write it as a definite integral. So once again here, I'm going to hopefully use the idea of the delta x to help me out. I see delta x right here. So delta x is equal to b minus a over n. And in this case, this is pi over n. So what I should realize, and what I hope you realize, is b minus a equals to pi. Right? The denominator is both n, so the numerators must be equal to each other too. Can you tell me my a value here, what I started with? Yeah, there's my a. So a is pi over 2, and since b minus a equals to pi, then b would be just a plus pi, or in this case, pi over 2 plus pi. That's right, 3 pi over 2. Well, look at that. You found your limits to the integral now. So you know we're going from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. Perfect. The question I have for you now is, what is the actual function? Well, hopefully you can see that, hey, it's sine of blah, 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 blah. So this must be just sine. And that blah, 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 blah here just represents our value x. So if you wrote down something like this, you are perfectly correct. Okay? Now let me just give you a quick note here before I um, actually talk about this other note. Okay? So, note, note. Two notes. Note. I want you to realize that actually other answers are possible for this one. Okay? Because I can actually just do horizontal shifts of my expression and I'll still get the same actual answer. So other answers are possible that involve horizontal shifts. So I've seen this on an AP exam before too where they actually shift things around and they say hey there might be multiple ways of writing this definite integral. For example if I were to shift everything let's say pi over 2 to the left okay so as an example, a shift pi over 2 to the left. What would happen? Well, yes, my function would be what? x plus pi over 2. Good. Remember all that stuff from pre-calculus days? But not only that, don't forget, I have to also shift my limits. And so if I shift pi over 2 to the left from pi over 2, that gives me just 0. And if I shift 3 pi over 2 to the left, that just gives me pi. So this is also an equivalent expression that is equal to that limit summation expression. Okay? Now, some of you might be thinking, we just focused on the right Riemann sums. I know. But if you think about using the left Riemann sum, that's fine too. The only difference is you're not going from k equals 0 to n minus or n, you're going from k equals to, sorry, you're not going from k equals to 1 to n, so let me look here once again. You see I have k equals to 1 to n. That would be what we did for the right Riemann sum. If I now change those two things, right, to k equals 0 and n minus 1, then you'll actually get the left Riemann sum, because now I've shifted it 1 to the left. Okay. In the end, the limit as n approached to infinity doesn't matter if you use right or left. You're both going to get the same answer. Okay? All right. That's it. Go practice. And congratulations. You have now finished unit number six.